Hi guys, uh, this is Mr. Cundiff on behalf of the counseling team here at Hidden Valley. Wanted to present uh, you this uh, brief introduction to trauma awareness for students here at Hidden Valley High School. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And begin just a brief little PowerPoint presentation. It'll take you through some understanding trauma uh, for students. Now, of course, um, a lot of people are aware of what trauma is and um, sometimes think it's simpler or more, actually more complex than it really is. And in fact, trauma can affect a lot of people in many, many different ways. It can be really big, it can be really small. Um, and of course, in some ways, co collectively, as, as, a, as a school, we've been living through what some may call tra trauma from, from living through COVID. So this kind of comes at a good time. Um, the first thing we want to make sure that you understand is to take care of yourself. So if at any point during this uh, presentation or any time really that you feel overwhelmed, um, ask your teacher if you can see any one of the counselors and we'll be happy to, to talk to you because we're here for you. Um, so the first thing to think about is what is trauma? Uh, trauma is an experience that overwhelms a person's ability to cope with life's daily stressors and problems or, or um, anything that you might try to do during the day. Um, extreme or chronic stress um, is another way to think about trauma and because it overwhelms a person's ability to cope and it results in people feeling vulnerable, uh, helpless, and afraid. As you see in the, in the picture there with the big word stress and then around it all other kinds of things like depression, strain, insecure, fear, overwhelmed triggered, anxious, horror. There's all kinds of things that can that can uh, be part of the definition of trauma. So trauma could be something as simple as a divorce or separation in your family. Um, it could be a, a death uh, of somebody that you care about. Um, it could be physical abuse, um, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, or neglect. Um, there may be financial difficulties in your family that are making it really difficult for your family to make it. Uh, it could be a natural disaster, uh, like a tornado or a hurricane or a flood. Um, but it can also be chronic toxic stress that sort of builds and builds and builds um, and becomes overwhelming. It could also be simple, something simple like a relocation, where your parents had to move and change jobs and you had to move to a new school, a new town. Um, and it could also involve conflict of some kind between, between you and somebody else. The one thing to remember, guys, is that trauma affects the brain very powerfully. So when the brain experiences trauma or toxic stress, it changes the way that we're able to handle everyday situations. Um, we're just not able to deal with life in the way that we normally would. And so it can mean something as simple as getting not a, good, a, a bad grade on a test or a conflict with a friend. And you're, you, it feels like your whole world is turned upside down because your brain's just not able to operate and deal with stress in the way that it used to be able to. And we also may have strong emotions. We might lack, have a lack of focus or our memory may be foggy. We may have conflicts with friends and family more so than we normally would. So that's really important to understand how it affects the brain. Now, you've all heard of fight, fly, fight, fly, flight, fight, or freeze. Um, when I was growing up, fight or flight was what we talked about a lot of times, which was, um, you know, if, if the saber-toothed tiger was about to jump out of the woods and you were a caveman or a cavewoman, what would you do? You would either freeze, I'm sorry, you would either fight or you would run. We've added one over the years known as freeze because some people simply freeze when something happens. So for example, um, in, in an everyday circumstance for a person who's experienced trauma, if you're triggered, you might have the tendency to, to run or, or flight or, or flee. Uh, so you escape the situation, you avoid, you walk away, you refuse to engage with those people in that situation in which you're triggered. Or you might fight, you might argue, you might yell, you might get physical, you might throw things or become physically aggressive, or you could freeze. And this would be simply shutting down, putting your head on top of a desk, refusing to communicate, unable to talk about your feelings. 
And the reason for this is because we have two parts of our brain when we think about trauma, our thinking brain and our emotional brain. And those, those are very, very important. The emotional brain is typically where the trauma is located and where those really intense emotions are located. And the thinking brain helps us make sense out of life. And so when, when you experience trauma, it's really hard for those two parts of the brain to communicate with each other. So here's a video I'm going to show you a little bit of, and it helps to uh, define a little bit about those two different parts of the brain. Explain this to teenagers. I start with the hand model, okay? And I start by explaining that we're going to talk about the downstairs brain and the upstairs brain that everyone has. Formally, this is called the limbic system, and this is called the cerebral cortex. But what we're going to talk is downstairs brain and upstairs brain. So in your downstairs brain, this is where fight, flight, or freeze lives, okay? When threat comes at you, your body has three reactions it can make. It can fight, it can run away, or it can stay very still until the danger's gone. That's what this brain does, okay, this part of the brain. What's up here, the upstairs brain, its job, among many other things, is to solve problems, to help you calm down, solve problems, okay? And to tell the downstairs brain, I got this. We're going to be okay. There's another solution. So what happens a lot of times to kids who've experienced trauma is if you think about these like muscles, because you've gone through a lot of threat, this downstairs part of the brain's been doing push-ups your whole life. Okay, so this part of the brain is really strong. The part of your brain that solves problems hasn't had as much exercise because you've had to be really strong to be a survivor, a thriver. So what happens is, is that the brain gets what I call emotionally hijacked. This downstairs brain comes up on top of this brain. It takes over, okay? So the downstairs brain's in control. And so you fight, you run, you freeze. The only things that work when you're down here are things that calm you down. So we call them self-regulation skills. And that happens from connection. Somebody talking to you, helping you breathe, helping you feel your body calm down. Once that happens, then the upstairs brain can calm back, and then you can solve problems. So, so here is um, a diagram of Dr. Dan Siegel, who talks about the, uh, what's known as, as the sheets explain the hand model of the brain. So you have uh, the survival brain, um, which has sensation and automatic responses uh, and functions, uh, and, and also the survival stat strategies of flight, flies, well, fight, flight, freeze, submit, collapse. You have the emotional brain, um, the regulation um, of memories and feelings. You have the amygdala, which is kind of like the smoke alarm that says that there is a problem, which is what gets triggered for somebody in trauma and sometimes gets triggered, triggered at times when it's really not uh, necessary. You have the thinking brain uh, or the cortex, uh, which is for uh, problem solving, critical thinking, and beliefs, impulse control, and things like that. And then you also have the offline brain, the survival brain, and you're not able, and once that happens, you're just not able to access the thinking brain. So what can we do to help? Um, if, if you have experienced trauma, practice self-regulation. And self-regulation, we're going to give you a few tips here in a second. Um, give yourself a break and remember that you're doing the best that you can. You, We all are doing the best that we can at any given moment in time. Sometimes we can do better. I'm doing the best that I can in, in recording this video, but I keep flubbing up my words. But I know that I'm doing the best that I can. Um, talk to a trusted adult, somebody in the school, uh, you know there are lots of people here that care about you and somebody that's willing to help you and talk to you. Um, what about if you know somebody, a friend, that's experienced trauma? This is the same thing that we've talked about when we've talked about expect respect and bullying, when we've talked about signs of suicide. If you know somebody has, um, has problems and has experienced uh, trauma, Show them, if you know some self-regulation strategies, show them those things. If you see them upset, help them. Encourage them to breathe. Encourage them to take deep breaths. Encourage them to go with you to a quiet place or to talk to somebody that can help them. And again, always refer them to a trusted adult. And if, they, if, they don't, if they're too afraid to go, feel free to tell a trusted adult here at the school um, that can reach out to them and help them. And always use supportive and caring language. 
Okay, so in breathing, obviously, self-regulation. Deep breathing is extremely important. Uh, we'll show you that in, in just a second. Grounding exercises are also important. Some schools have calming corners. This is more popular in elementary schools, but I've seen it in high schools. Um, some people love music. Uh, that helps them to regulate. Some people love art or dance. They like to draw or write or color. Um, and these develop, help you develop coping skills. Those are coping skills, but you can develop other ad additional coping skills when you reach out for help uh, with a counselor or a trusted adult. Um, and then again, talking to somebody that can help you. So in grounding, one of the things we do in grounding exercises is to have someone who's really experiencing a moment where they felt triggered. Um, and we can do this in a really um, serene setting, but you can also do it in everyday situations such, in a such as in a classroom. If all of a sudden you find yourself feeling anxious and panicky about something because you're remembering something that's happened, look around you. What are five things that you can see? What are four things that you can hear? What are three things that you can touch? What are two things that you can smell? Uh, what is one thing you can taste? And you can also remind yourself, what am I sitting on? What do I feel under my under myself in the chair? What do I feel under my feet? What can I see around me? What can I hear? That will help you to, to come out of the clouds, as it were, and back down to reality a little bit more. Another thing you can do is what's known as a body scan. It's very simple. You just sit in a relaxed position. Your eyes can be open or shut, how, whatever makes you comfortable. And you choose a color. Maybe it's blue or green or turquoise or something like that. And you just imagine that it moves over you. Stop at the top of your, or start with the top of your head and go all the way down to the tips of your toes. And it's the idea that that, that relaxation is moving down over you. And you're breathing calmly and deeply and safely as you have allow the body scan to work. A couple of different ways of practicing breathing. There are a ton of them out there and sometimes it really doesn't matter how you breathe. It's important that you do breathe and that you breathe slowly because if you breathe too quickly, we call that hyperventilation, uh, that tends to keep your amygdala more worked up. So if you can you know, breathe in through your nose for four seconds, hold it for four seconds, let it out for four seconds, and then hold that for four seconds. And then continue to repeat that over and over again until you begin to feel calmer. And what'll happen, your amygdala will start to calm and then your thinking self will be able to come back into control. Lazy eight breathing is basically the same thing where you sort of trace a figure eight where you breathe in and you breathe out, you breathe in and you breathe out. And it's very slow. And by doing that, you calm yourself down. There are a lot of other strategies, guys, out there to help um, if you've experienced trauma. And we're here to help you as a counseling department and would love to talk with you. So if for any reason you, you need to talk, uh, feel free to reach out to us at any time. On your post-test, there'll be a question if, um, asking you if you'd like to talk to somebody. So please use that. And we'd be happy uh, to sit with you, talk with you, teach you some of these skills in real life. And uh, if needed, we can help you get the help that you need uh, from somebody else. Thanks so much for watching and um, have a great day.